Well, hey there. Welcome to the Five Factors Podcast. This is Matt Adair. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting in my house and uh, in our office here, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can record this intro because I've got, I've got some guys that are here doing some work in one of our bathrooms. Uh, a couple of things that we're doing in terms of a, a little bit of uh, repair uh, that also includes my nine-year-old pulling off the shower door <laughs> last night. So uh, if there's banging around, I'll have to re-record this, but so far so good. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. Uh, excited about today's conversation with Barnabas Piper. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, several of his books that he's written, and I'm really excited about this conversation for you as a church leader, uh, because we're going to be talking about some things that I think can easily get missed in our life and ministry, particularly the place for curiosity and the place for doubt. And I want you to imagine um, your ministry and your life being a place where curiosity and doubt thrive. And we're going to talk about what that means and what that looks like. But one of the things that I find so often is, is that we want to be so helpful for people that we can kind of cut, we can just sort of rub off the edges of life and leave very little room for people to, to not just be curious, but to even leave room for doubt to say, I don't know. And, uh, I don't know how that should work. Um, but so this conversation with Barnabas, um, who is, uh, not a pastor, uh, but somebody who has been in Christian publishing, grew up in the church, um, has, uh, again, I just think a unique perspective that's going to be very, very helpful for you. Um, as you think about your own life, in your leadership within your church or within your ministry. We also got a word kind of towards the end of the interview, just kind of a very clear message to you. If you're listening to this, you're a mom, a dad, in addition to being a pastor and a church leader, um, would love for you to hear about this because Barnabas wrote a great book on uh, what it means to be a preacher's kid and how to navigate that world. And so I think he's going to help you with that. So a fun conversation. Uh, we kind of just dug in here on some, uh, just what it looks like for us to lead churches and maybe reimagining the way we think about our, our messaging, our lives, the way we present ourselves. So I'll quit talking and go ahead and let you listen to this conversation that I had with Barnabas Piper. Here with Barnabas Piper. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, man. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Um, so it's a little early that we're recording this this morning. Um, do, you, do you consider yourself to be a morning person? Uh, by nurture, not nature. <laughs> uh, by by necessity, I guess. Between between having small children who are now old enough that they don't get up early anymore, but then that and various jobs I've had, I've learned how to how to be a morning person. Yeah. So, what does that routine look like for you at this point? Well, currently, um, I I have more flexibility in my current job because I can work from home more, which means getting up early is more voluntary than it used to be. For Right. A lot of years to beat traffic or to catch mass transit, I was up and out the door by six. Yeah. Um, so if I wanted to do, you know, be in the word at all or have any peace and quiet or drink any coffee, all of which I, are things I value, uh, I would have to get up, you know, five o'clock or before. So I still try to keep that habit because that is a good time to to just sort of set the day off right. I usually... You know, and, and do you kind of feel like you need that? Like for me, I feel like if I don't have time to kind of prime the pump before uh, my kids are up primarily mm -hmm. uh, that I'm just going to be, uh, I'm going to be a monster to them yes. and I don't want to be. Yeah. That monster to my kids uh, is exactly how I would describe myself. If I don't get up in enough advance of them to, to get a little breathing room, to maybe to take the dog for a walk, to drink coffee, to, uh, you know, read or spend time in the ward or both. or just sort of like have that time of, of mental and emotional sort of foundation laying for the day. Cause yeah, otherwise if I get up 10 minutes before them and then I try to help them get ready for school or, or on a weekend, you know, if we all sleep in and get up at the same time, that, that means everybody's in a bad mood at the same time that, right. that never goes well. So I need to get in a good mood before they get up with a bad mood. That's right. Somehow got to, you're the one who's like, this is going to be a great day. Now don't ask me how I felt 15 minutes ago, but you know, That's now right. while we're getting up kids, we're ready. I have to remember um, that I have to remember that I'm the adult. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that is a shocker. You turn around like, Oh wait, I'm not one of y'all. Um, it's, it's surprising. <laughs> yeah, and then um, you get sucked into their arguments. So how are you deciding between like reading, um, or diving into the scriptures? Um, well, I mean, scripture is, is a, is a constant. So when I say reading, I guess it just means, um, there are times, you know, I'll mix in other books, you know, or, or usually there it's, it is some sort of devotional reading. So for the last several months, I have been kind of poking my way through Tim Keller's book, uh, songs of Jesus. It's his mm -hmm. devotional on the Psalms and it goes 365 days and has dates on it. 
which I completely ignore yeah. um, because I don't like being told what to do. There you go. Um, but, but it's just, so I guess that's reading and being in the word simultaneously because it's, it's either a portion of a psalm or an entire psalm and then a very brief reflection that sort of ties that into, into life, into the gospel, sort of the weaving of those things together. Um, or I'll read and another thing I'm using right now is the Spurgeon Study Bible that just mm-hmm. came out recently, which, you know, so I'll read a chapter from, I think I'm, I'm working my way through Matthew right now, and then spend a fair amount of time reading Spurgeon's kind of commentary on that. And it's just, so it's just, it's a nice combination of scripture with somebody wiser than me teaching about scripture, which yeah. just gives me perspective I would have otherwise missed. And, you know, honestly, at, at 530 in the morning, um, my brain isn't the sharpest. And so rigorous study of the word is, <laughs> doesn't always go well. So to have somebody right. really brilliant and wise feeding me that stuff is really beneficial. Yeah. So um, I think you have a neat, unique perspective. You've, you've worked in publishing. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you also uh, tend not to be the cheerleader for all things Christian uh, in terms of <laughs> on a mass market. So w- with all of the Bibles that are out there, it, you know, it feels like not only just different translations, but different mm-hmm. versions of the translation. So a Spurgeon study Bible, a left-handed dyslexic Bible, all those type of things, right? Um, you know, where's the, the? There's obviously some tension here between just uh, just putting stuff out there to put it out there. Um, so, you know, how how do you when you look at it determine this is helpful, this is beneficial, or just this is just silly? Why do why like why do we need another version of this? Yeah, I the, the more um, I think the more specific something gets in application, like you you know left handed dyslexic Bible or the Fisherman's Bible or whatever, like right. those things, it's very hard for me not to be just outright cynical about because because a fisherman's soul is exactly the same as everybody else's soul Mm -hmm. they don't need a special application and special stories tying you know matthew 5 to a to a rapala lure like (laughs) it's not that helpful same with like the athlete's bible whatever but when it comes to bibles with teaching from somebody who has a legacy like the advantage of somebody like say spurgeon is that we know what his legacy is because he's dead which means he's not going to foul it up. So putting his name on the Bible and taking select teachings of his to support scripture is taking the perfect word of God and allowing one of history's best preachers to illuminate it and, and teach it. I'm a little, I have a mixed feelings about living teachers' names on Bibles mm-hmm. because that, that can easily lead somebody into idolatry. Sure. Um, and, but the way that I use Bible versions is I tend to rotate about every 12 months anyway, because I have the very human trait of getting bored. Right. And that means that I need something fresh to keep, to keep scripture in front of me uh, in a way that I haven't seen it before. So going yeah. back, you know, there are some people who have used the same Bible for 30 years and it's, it's rich with their notes and their underlining. And I'm kind of jealous of those people and I'm yeah. not one of them. Right. I need, you know, I have a stack of Bibles that I've underlined, you know, the portions that I've read in that 12 months, and then I move on to something else. Right. So that, that's where different versions, different study Bibles, things like that are a benefit to me, um, because I rarely lean on them for so long that that becomes a, a, a crutch to me, or, you know, I sort of become just stuck in that mindset. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think it's. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Crawford Loritz uh, with his grandsons with Brian's boys. Mm-hmm. Like he, you know, he'll use a Bible for a year, underline it, make notes, give it to him. Like that's that's a beautiful thing, you know. And some people do have. Uh, uh, I was actually looking at my uh, granddad's Bible who passed away uh, about a year ago, and uh, yeah, all these all these notes. I'm like, I'm fascinated by it, but quite honestly. Uh, you know, I tend to do so much of my stuff, even digitally, uh, mm-hmm. the, you know, the Bible app is a great thing. And, uh, and so if there's something that's lost, something that I've really been thinking about lately, uh, in terms of discipling my own boys and things like that, and like how, you know, passing those things on, but I'm with you in terms of needing different translations and needing to look at things in a slightly different way. Um, so, uh, with, uh, with Keller's book, uh, and my wife have read through, uh, we've read through that and now we're using the one on Proverbs, mm-hmm. um, you know, for you, uh, and I know for some people, People, they're like, okay, so there's kind of a pre-written prayer and there's this kind of reflection on that. Um, uh, what's the benefit of that particularly for you? 
Well, to be honest, I usually skip the prayer part. Okay. Um, I have a, I really struggle with pre-written prayers. Mm-hmm. Um, is it just the, like period or book of common prayer or just, just, I mean, just, just in general with, well, except in corporate worship. So okay. if there's like a, if there's a, a liturgical element to it, I, I, I appreciate that because then it's, then it's joining with people in something, you know, and that's, that feels differently to me than reading a, you know, a rote prayer. Um, and I, it's, that's not to disparage those. That's more just sort of what connects with my soul. So if I think there are people who go to that and either they don't know how to pray or they, they're just at a place where praying is something that's a, a challenge, whether it's because they're in a dark place in the soul or they're a new believer or whatever it is. And there's a, those kinds of prayers are super beneficial. I, I don't find them such for me. Yeah. Um, so for me, it is a, I almost, I almost find like that, that the Keller book, the songs of Jesus book to be more like, it's more like spiritual vitamins than it is a spiritual meal. Yeah. Um, because, because it's a, it's a short portion of scripture with a short reflection, but you know, there, there are those days when you don't have time to sit down and do bacon and eggs and toast and orange juice and coffee. Some mornings it's, you grab something real fast and run out the door, right. but you, your body needs the nutrition. In this case, the soul needs the nutrition. And that's kind of the benefit I find there. I also find that it's, it works just as well to read four or five days at once, right. you know? And so you read through two or three Psalms with two or three or six or seven reflections, depending on how it's broken up. And then it is more of a meal. So it's a, it, it serves that function for me. You know, it's a, it is spiritual nutrition. It's packed with it but it's also concise, which, you know, as much as I have aspirations of spending enormous amounts of time in the word, yeah. realistically, I, it's hard to do. And right. so being able to do that instead of no time in the word is still, I mean, it's infinitely better than nothing. Yes. Yeah. Something's better than nothing. But I, I do think one of the challenges for me in, in pastoring our church here in Athens is that trying to convince our people that, if you read the scriptures, uh, it's going to be valuable. Uh, you, mm-hmm. there, you, 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 who has the hour and a half long inductive Bible study? Who has time uh, for that? Um, right. Not even the guy who's the pastor. So, I mean, that's that's really challenging, I think, uh, getting into that. Um, I want to talk about uh, your last book. It's been out almost a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, after a year, is that one of those things where you feel like, man, that's a distant memory? Are there, <laughs> uh, you know, is there, you know, after a year, are there things that you get feedback from people or as you reflect on the book? Is there something that just kind of stands out uh, and kind of just rises to the surface? Um, so, yeah, the last book was, um, was called The Curious Christian, just yeah. looking at taking curiosity into all of life and how it, how it brings to life this massive, wonderful complexity that God has created both in us as image bearers and then in the world around us. And that right there that I just said is probably the hardest part because it does, it can feel a little bit like a, you know, sort of a tagline, uh, right. And there's also, there's a product nature to it. So I do work yeah. in publishing. And so once a book is six months old in publishing, it's kind of old news mm-hmm. or it's very old news. And so a book that's a year old, like if I ever get a comment on a book that's a year old, I'm kind of like, wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. Did that happen? And so, maybe even, it's like even me if being I asked it. about a sermon, you know, right. six months or a year ago, right? Yeah. It's like once the words are out there, they just sort of fade into the background. Yeah. But as an author, that's dishonest of me if I allow that to be the case, because I, I ought to be pursuing the message that I'm encouraging other people to pursue. So I think that's the ongoing benefit and challenges. Uh, You write a book, that's accountability for you Mm -hmm. because you now have a standard to up, up to which you have to live. Um, And so I, you know, I put that out there and that means that I should still be and still do try to be intentionally curious in how I engage relationships and my work and my spiritual life and, and see those things weave together because that's what I tried to point to the benefit of and encourage readers to do. Um, but it is, you know, there is a challenge of that sort of fading into the background and life becoming rote again. Yeah. And I think there's something extremely helpful about the book, especially for people who are naturally curious and have either grown up in educational environments, maybe even church environments mm-hmm. where that seems to get to down be downplayed for the person who struggles to be curious. They just yeah. kind of go through life and they're just kind of naturally, they encounter something and go, okay, I guess that's how it is. Um, and, and I'm thinking particularly for pastors and church leaders, maybe mm-hmm. because they assume they have to be, they have to be confident like that. But the person who struggles to either to leave room for that in their own mm-hmm. life or in their own 
ministry. Um, uh, help them kind of at least begin to reimagine the possibilities uh, of including curiosity in their own life and ministry. Yeah, that's, I like the way you put that in terms of leaving room, because I think, I think that's a misconception that people have is that to, to do something like grow in curiosity. First of all, most people don't think in terms of curiosity. They think curiosity is a childish trait Mm -hmm. or a trait for hobbyists. You know, people are curious about new bands or exploring in the woods or going hiking or things like that, but they don't think of curiosity in all of life, which is the thing that I tried to, I tried to write about in, in a way that would be compelling. Um, and, and so first it's the reframing and realizing that curiosity is, is an intentional effort to, to notice and discover, which is a thing that God has woven into us because, because he is infinitely discoverable. There's always more about God to be discovered and the same is true of God's creation. So that being the case, curiosity is essential. So first is reframing your mind that way. And the second, the, the part about leaving room is the fact that it, you don't have to change your life that much to be intentionally curious. You have to change your mindset. Yeah. But you can do almost the exact same things every day. You just do them differently. Right. So we were talking about reading the word a few minutes ago. Uh, that is the best starting place mm-hmm. because you go to the word regularly, let's hope, especially pastors. And, but if you're not going with this understanding that this is a window into who this infinite God we worship and preach and proclaim is, well, what are you doing? Yeah. It, you're checking a box. You're, 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 it's, a, it's a job description. It's, it's, a, it's what is it? You know, what are you doing? So there has to be that reframing of the mindset to say, every day is an opportunity for profound discovery, even if it's a verse I've read 827 times. Yeah. So, and you hear this a lot when people talk about gratitude, right? And so that's kind of in the marketplace. You'll hear so much about the importance of gratitude and mindset and things like that. What's the, when you think about the relationship between curiosity and gratitude, how do those, how do those tie in together? Hmm. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but I see a really clear connection because if you are discovering things, whether it's about God, I mean, take curiosity into human relationships, um, whether it's with fellow staff members, whether it's with a spouse or children or whoever, uh, there's, there's this profound opportunity to see more about that person, to find out more about them, which is also an opportunity to discover new things to be grateful about. The flip side of that is that if you're going through life, seeking to be a grateful person, it means you are looking for things about which you should be grateful, right. which leads to discoveries. So it's curiosity through the lens of gratitude, yeah. or you can get to gratitude by being curious. Like they, yeah. they, they begin to be, it's sort of a cyclical feeding. Um, just this, well, several years ago, I had a mentor who encouraged me being a, I'm a fairly cynical person who can be critical often. He encouraged me to make it, he said, make a habit of writing down things you're thankful for. He knew I was a journaler and he said, just, you know, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, a thousand things a year or whatever, just right. make a note. And that was, that was incredibly helpful to me because I just started noticing small things to be thankful for. If I would sit down at the end of a week and I hadn't written down anything to be thankful for, I had to reflect on my week and go, what was good this week? Oh, it was lunch with that friend. It was taking a walk with my kids. It was, you know, this, the the weather being sunny that one day this week and rainy the rest of the week, you know, and all of a sudden I'm discovering a way to think about life and notice life that I'd otherwise missed. So just that habit of being grateful feeds curiosity and vice versa. Yeah. And when you think about just your own cynicism, how much of that for you is you look around, you see a, a malevolent world that is filled with evil or how much of that is for you? You're just like, I'm just not buying into this whole charade uh, that, we're, that we're selling here. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, I, I hope it's more the former than the latter. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a combination of, it's a combination of just personality. Being a, I, I tend to be a take a step back and observe kind of person rather than dive in and fully embrace mm-hmm. an experience. So I'm, I'm much more sort of observer, articulator, that personality. Yeah. But then there's also, there's also just an element of what I, what I hope is realism in it. You know, when I see somebody, like when I look at, when I look at the shelf upon shelf of, of self-help books and name it, claim it theology and all that stuff, I look at it and I go, 
if anybody took six seconds to think about these things, right. they would realize it's, it's all bunk. Like right. it's just nonsense. Yeah. And so there's that, I think that's realism. I think it's realism that's based in the word of God and realism also based on just like empirical data. Look around, it doesn't work. And so there's, there's, a, there's some of both of that. And then the other, there's another piece, which is having grown up steeped in the church Mm -hmm. I see both the profound good, which is why I still work for a company that serves the church, why I am working very hard to be part of a church, which is not an easy thing for me to do. And, and also why I look at it and I go, there are so many stupid things about how like the Christian industry, not churches yeah. specifically, but just the Christian industry has, has done things. And so there's always a push and pull there, but I, I hope it's much more looking around going, there's a lot of things in this world about which we should buy in less and be more critical rather than just being a, I don't buy it cynic who, who refuses to recognize the good. Yeah, there's something powerful about that perspective. You know, I was listening to um, uh, a, a recent episode of, of your podcast and y'all were talking about just the, the banality of motivational motivation. <laughs> and, um, and, and so one of the things that I, I felt like, and I wrote this down as I was just thinking uh, about our conversation is one of the things that I do think that you bring to the table and are helpful to us in the church is there's almost a sense of guys, we can do better. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have to settle for this. And I, I think some of that really does fit into this, even just being curious that, hey, why do we have to settle for things that are scratching the surface that use these uh, tropes that maybe work for a handful of people? But, you know, and, and I'm, I'm with you. I've never been one to be the guy that gets super motivated by somebody coming in like, let's just get all fired up for whatever it is. Uh, and, you know, well, the work's going to be hard. Yeah. And I don't know what the outcome is going to be. And uh, some of that's wiring and some of that is just going, hey, I think we could do different. And I think it, it might actually help us be who we want to be. Uh, yeah. I am interested in terms of church and, um, and, 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 you know, for you, as you said, kind of that struggle to, to be engaged in a local church. And I think this is important for pastors and church leaders to, to you know, really work through this because I, I think it's easy for us to assume that um, everybody who's there, loves it. Um, and, uh, and the people who are struggling, well, you know, that maybe that's a them issue. So talk a little bit about what just that wrestling match, having grown up mm -hmm. in the church. Um, and now in terms of where you are, I mean, what is, what does that journey look like for you in this season? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, tying it back into, to our comments about cynicism. Um, I think the worst sort of cynic is the type who's critical and that's the end of it. So I yeah. think if, if I choose to be cynical about something or if I find myself being cynical, the only way that that is beneficial or productive is if I then say, well, well what's better? Mm -hmm. And then am I taking any sort of proactive steps? So, because cynicism without proactive steps is just complaining. Right. And, you know, the Bible has some fairly pointed things to say about grumbling and complaining, yeah. uh, which is a struggle for me. I, I gravitate towards that mindset unless I'm curiously pursuing something. So when it comes to church membership, it is much easier for me to analyze a church and be cynical about its problems than it is for me to proactively say, I want to be part of this church. That being said, the way that many churches are set up to get people to be part of them feels incredibly, um, I don't want to say unnatural because then pastors would be like, yes, it's supernatural. That's not what I mean. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's not normal. Yeah. It's not helpful. It doesn't, doesn't resonate with the human experience and how right. people operate. Right, exactly. So it's, it's, it's outside of what's useful, not just what's, because the church should be abnormal in a, in a positive way, but this is abnormal in, in a, it's, it's just uncomfortable kind of way. Um, yeah, and, tell me, I mean, talk more about that because I, I think you're right, I, I, but we might be talking about different things. Right. I mean, this is, so this is, this is an ongoing process for me because it's a, I have a conviction to be invested in the local church, in a local church, not just the local church at large. Um, but when I walk into a church on Sunday morning, where, where the rubber meets the road is a challenge because the culture of churches often doesn't resonate with me very well. Right. So I love the gospel. I love the sermons. I love many of the words and the songs, but then the culture of the church is something that I struggle with. Yeah. And, and how might... much of that do you think is your own wiring? How much of that is your own history? Uh, both and something else. 
Um, I, I think that is the question that I'm, you know, I'm kind of trying to figure out right now. I think, I think a lot of it is my own background as, you know, as long-term pastor's kid, having worked in Christian nonprofit and church ministry for a lot of years now. Um, and, and so there is, there's a lot of jadedness there. But if it's true for me, then it's true for a lot of other people because right. there's, there's thousands and thousands of people who grew up in the church. There's thousands of pastor's kids and thousands of Christian company employees. The thing, that I, well, the thing that I cannot quite figure out, and I can't figure out if this is cynicism or realism, is looking around at people who just, they get geeked up to go to church. You know, they're the ones who are tweeting about it on Sunday morning and they're just, you know, that pastor was preaching fire and this and that and the other thing. And like, I just, I resonate with none of it. Right. Um, and I don't know if that's a problem on my part or if there is something there that they're just sort of, they're sheep, you know, just sort of, mm-hmm. just sort of following along behind the, you know, what, what we were talking about a second ago, that, that motivational aspect of things where there are a lot of people who get hyped up about hype. They don't yeah. get, they don't get hyped up because of a good thing. Right. Now church is, is often veiled hype. It's mm-hmm. hype veiled in the cross. It's hype veiled in the gospel. It's hype veiled in worship music and veiled in, in community or whatever these catchphrases are, but the substance may not be worthy of the, worthy of the energy and the hype. And oftentimes right. it's veiled in a really good communicator. Yeah. Pastors are some of the best communicators out there, not all of them, but right. it's many. So yeah. it's, and it's often a place that good communicators get elevated to, um, possibly without all of the other qualifications. Right. And so, and so there's, there's that element that draws people in. People are suckers for a good communicator and a good story and a good narrative. Now I need to pause because it sounds like I'm, I'm, you know, this, this, this is the push and pull for me yeah. because, um, because the church is God's way of reaching the world. Local bodies of believers representing Christ, preaching the word, reaching unbelievers, reaching communities. And I wholeheartedly believe that. And all of this other stuff I also believe to be true. Yeah. Bridging the gap between those two things is sort of my, I, I don't know if it's my ministry. I don't know if it's just my, it, it is definitely a daily and weekly process for me to think through and hopefully help other people think through because what i don't want to do is push people away from the church with my cynicism because right. that's that's the opposite of christian well I, I think one of the one of the things that i know it's been beneficial for me uh especially where we are uh or in and and the people who are in our church is that for me as a pastor um, I have to learn to go, I like this person. They're struggling with the church. Don't take it so personally. Dang it. Um, and uh, remember that it is a journey and do a good job of listening. And I, I do think it's a, it's a challenge for pastors because I think beyond the, uh, we want everybody, we want great morale. We want everybody to be on board. We want everybody to be excited about the vision all the way down into the personal stuff that says, if you don't like what I'm cooking, Mm-hmm. Well, what does that say about me? And uh, while we would love for pastors to not deal with that kind of head trash, they do. And so, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's important for us to have voices, maybe even if they're not people that we're sitting across the table from, but they're reading your books, they're listening to your podcast. Uh, but on some level, they're like, I like this guy. I trust him. But what he's saying does challenge some of my assumptions about how I need to think about the people in my church. Yeah. And, and the way that they're engaging that, you know, that's, you know, that's helpful. I, mean, uh, I want to talk about um, your second book, uh, Help My Unbelief. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, one of the questions I was thinking about is in your mind, what's the difference between curiosity and doubt? Yeah, well, they're, they're both bred from the same place, which is a place of questions. Um, and well, doubt is something that I worked, I tried to work hard in that book to, to define at a starting point, if for no other reason, so that everybody's working off the same definition. And I, I simply see doubt. It's doubt is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a sinful thing in and of itself. Uh, It is simply an, an inability to know something. So doubt is, I don't know. I'm not sure. That's not a bad thing. That's most of life for us. Right. Uh, How we respond to doubts, especially about God and his word, or in my case, the church, um, determines whether or not it's sinful doubt 
or the kind of doubt that can lead us in a beneficial, even faith building direction. Yeah. Um, when it starts moving in that direction. So it's the kind of doubt that you're saying, I don't know, but I trust. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I want to find the truth. I don't know, but I believe that God is who God says he is. Then you're moving towards very beneficial curiosity because you're exploring and you're seeking. That's what curiosity is. You're saying, I don't know, but I believe that, that, that God is working, that God's creation does bear his fingerprints that God's image is born in these people. So what I don't know about them, I'm not going to be skeptical and judgmental about. I'm going to dig into to understand who, what is reflected of God in this situation or this person. Whereas the sinful kind of doubt, first of all, it removes you from God because you no longer trust him. And second of all, it removes you from beneficial relationships with God's creation and with, with God's people because you no longer are seeking God reflected in those things, yeah. his fingerprints, his creative ability, his image born in a, in a fellow human. So that's the division there, I think, is the response to doubt either pushes you into this kind of curiosity that breathes life into kind of all things, or it really shrinks your soul and your heart and your life down because you're pulled away from curiosity because you seeking is no longer safe. And it's, it's a thing that only leads to, to frustration or anger or rebellion. Right. What, what do you think it would take for um, most uh, pastors, preachers, church leaders to create a culture uh, of healthy doubt? Uh, a willingness to get hurt. Mm. Because it can't happen in a church unless the pastor does it. Yeah. And, you know, when you were talking earlier about pastors dealing with some of those very sort of that, that very human experiences – something that was pinging around in my head was, yeah, that's what, that's what churches need. They need human pastors, not pastory pastors. I wish, you know, as somebody who's not a pastor currently, when I sit down across a table from somebody to have lunch or coffee or whatever, and they're a pastor within 30 seconds, I can tell, are they a human or are they going to try to pastor me? Mm -hmm. One of those two things I can build a relationship with. Yeah. The other one I can play the game. Yeah. Um, and so, so for that, for a culture of acceptance of doubters dealing with those sort of complicated, complex, difficult, messy things in a church, it has to start with the pastor where there's not a, there's not an airbrushed perfection and also not an airbrushed authenticity because that, that has become like the new perfection is, is perfect imperfection. Yeah. You know, it's, and that's just, that's equally frustrating to me because those of us who have been around can see through that too. So instead of the pastor legitimately being like, I don't know, it's a, it's that airbrush sort of, I'm authentically telling you about my problems, right? but it doesn't feel authentic. It feels like a portrayal. Yeah. It's, it's, I know how to basically tell this chapter in the hero's story um, yeah. that way, you know, every hero encounters a problem and I'm going to tell you about my problem. Right. Watch, yeah, every, watch what happens on the flip side. That's right. Every great story has, you know, and, and, and culturally we see the same thing. We love, we love the flawed hero. You know, you watch the Marvel shows on Netflix, you know, whether it's Jessica Jones or Daredevil or whatever, all of those people are flawed. They have broken relationships. There's tension and like that feeds the narrative and it's what makes a great story. Um, but what we miss is that that's not the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. It's not the way God designed it. God did not design us to have these issues. He did, however, give us the gospel, the Holy Spirit, and community to help us through them. So we can't portray the problems as part of the hero story, but as part of the need story. Yeah. And that's where I think pastors... I don't think congregations see pastors as needy of Jesus as they themselves are, which creates this massive chasm between the pulpit and the pew. And, you know, what's interesting thinking about your dad's ministry is the fact that, I mean, uh, I would say, uh, and, and I've, I've said that uh, your, your dad was kind of the, uh, he kind of revolutionized all this stuff that we have in terms of church world, in terms of the internet, mm -hmm. because, you know, when, when that 96 version of Desiring God came out and all of a sudden I'm on the internet, I'm like, oh, all of his sermons are here. And, and you read all that, but you see somebody who does project this air of certainty and, and an air of need. Um, it's a little bit different. And so I think part of it is, I mean, you have to be yourself, but right. it does seem like what I hear you saying is that for pastors is that you have to 
at least start with yourself and, and almost take stock of where are those places where you honestly do have doubt in this world. Yeah. And you don't have to go then create a perfect six week preaching series on it. But I think when we begin to open ourselves up to that possibility, then it allows some of those things to come out um, in a sermon, um, sitting across the table from somebody in a counseling situation where you just have to say, I'm so sorry. I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer here. And, and people respond to empathy. And if a past, so empathy is walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. Yeah. It's yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. I understand because I am there or I have been there. And that is something that pastors verbalize often. I, I completely understand. Yeah. But there's not that resonance of, no, I'm crying and you're not crying. No, yeah. I'm depressed and you're not depressed. Like those, that creates a gap. Yeah. And so, so for a pastor to be able to address some of those things, so some of the best pastors I know are pastors of not large churches, because mm -hmm. I think if you're this kind of pastor, it's probably really hard to be a mega church pastor yeah. because mega churches tend to grow on the strength of other things. Right. Not, and that's not a criticism of those things. It's just, just an observation. Just apples and oranges. Yeah. So, but they're guys who they talk about their background with mental you know, whether, whether it's depression or anxiety, whether it's, it's, you know, obesity and physical health things or substance abuse in their past, but not with the happy ending. Like yeah. that's where, that's what drives me nuts is people like, I gained victory over those things because then the person who's struggling is like, well, I don't see victory in sight. So you and I were not the same. Right. But it's, it's a, it, it has to be, it has to be built around the need of redemption that draws people together. So the pastor's story of brokenness, even if there has been a level of victory, the victory is not the pastors. Right. The victory is the thing that is available to everybody right. because it's, it is Christ that gives that thing. And so that's, and, and this shouldn't be revolutionary to pastors, but, but there is such a subtle difference, subtle and enormous difference between preaching victory in Jesus yeah. and showing people your need for Jesus to be the victor. Yeah. Well, and I think this is part of the the challenge of marketing and as somebody who has to do marketing in a business um, uh, and knowing how these things work at some point in time, if somebody is going to uh, listen to read, buy your stuff, the marketing is going to tell you, you need to be the expert. You need mm -hmm. to show them how this works. And, and it does seem like particularly in certain circles uh, of, of American Christianity, at least that we place a high value on embodied Christianity. Um, so if, if, uh, if you're telling me that my life needs to be built around, uh, God's blessing of being healthy and wealthy, then mm -hmm. by God, I mean, we better make sure that the pastor and, and his family look healthy and wealthy. And so I think that's a challenge, but the flip side of that is I, I, I do think that there is something available within the Christian message that says, there are no experts here. That's not right. my job and that's not my role. And quite honestly, if you were to kind of uh, walk um, not for very long in my shoes, you'd see that there, I, I'm not the expert on really much of anything. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, it's the, I think it's the difficulty for pastors to find the language to be able to communicate because I, I really believe that there are guys out there that are communicating, um, you know, both men and women who are pastors that are communicating things that they don't necessarily believe that are true, but they don't feel like they've got yeah. another avenue. And I, I think, I think that's where, I think that's where pastors probably need to take a time out. Maybe it's a sabbatical vacation, <laughs> a day away, whatever it is, and chew on the reality of the, the, where we live. We live between Christ having come, which means victory is completed, yeah. but it's not completed. We are stuck between the already and the not yet. And this is not to get eschatological, but simply to say, we don't live in, in, in a life of happy endings and a life of, um, of completed narratives. So that the perfect brokenness, you know, it, that's like a Christian publishing thing now where there's all these books about seeking satisfaction and brokenness and anxiety, all of which need to be addressed yeah. because it's a profound issue for people. But most of them tie things up, mm -hmm. you know, or they present it as like, you, you can come out the other side and you too can have a perfect, happy suburban life yes. or yuppie urban life or whatever. Yeah. And that's not true right? for most people. I mean, there's a lot of people who are going to be depressed and anxious until they die when they will meet Jesus and all of it will be fixed. Yeah. It's, and so that, that's, that's, I think, what we need to allow people. 
but that's a scary thing to tell people to tell mm-hmm. people you you might just deal with this for the rest of your life you might take two steps forward and one and three quarter steps back every day from now until you go home and but that's reality yeah and that's what that's what I don't see from pastors. I see, I see a subtle buying into from many. I didn't get, I don't want to, I don't want to make sure. blanket statements about every preacher. That's completely unfair. Um, but it resonates see, because it's familiar. Yeah. I see, I see a subtle buying into present promise instead of future promise. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't want to preach doom and gloom either because I, I do believe there is victory for some people. And I do right. believe that, I mean, there's, but there's not a one size fits all how this is going to work itself out. Yeah. And Not even for the pastor. Especially when we put that sense of satisfaction in the wrong you know, basket. I mean, I, I think about, you know, it's the, you, you can't tell every couple struggling with infertility, you're going to have a baby. You can't right. tell every pastor of a church of 150, hey, you're going to 10X this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think that's the subtle message that we hear, you know, I'm not you... even sure you should tell every pastor they should. <laughs> right. I mean, I, 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 t- okay. Pastors, a little word of encouragement. I would rather att- attend a church of 500 than a 5,000 period. Right. I would rather attend a church of healthy people who of, of 120 than of healthy programs and, and 12,000. Like I just numbers mean zilch when it right. comes to ministry. They well, just and I, don't. I, I think one of the things that, that helps is when you do talk to pastors of larger churches, they're like, hey, you know, I mean, there are some things we did well, we can pass those along, but seriously, you can't replicate this. This isn't a formula. Uh, but because Un- we- I, Until a Christian publisher comes to them and says, hey, how did you do this? And then all right. of a sudden they're like, well, here's the seven steps we took. Yes, and here's so, our, here's like our they, perfect framework. There's a little bit of a, of a talking out of two sides of the ministerial mouth there. Yeah. I mean, I, I can remember uh, uh, being backstage with uh, w- with a pastor and we were at a conference together and he said, hey, uh, I'm thinking about saying this and talking about our struggles at our big, large, massive church and talking to church planners. I was like, you can't do that. And he's like, why not? I said, because I, I know you have struggles, but your struggles don't count with these guys because mm-hmm. they're first world problems. They're big church problems. And I do think it's really, really difficult in the world yeah. that we live in for pastors of, uh, of not just ordinary sized churches, which would be a, a church of 50, right. but a church of 150, 250, 500 to go, you're okay. Um, and a matter of fact, you, there are some very real benefits here mm-hmm. that you wouldn't have if this thing was 10 X. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, I mean, what you just said about first world problems is so true. Like the, the scale of the problems changes so dramatically when your struggles are capital campaigns yeah. for, for new student centers <laughs> right. versus can yeah. I keep uh, the lights on? Yes. You know, can I pay the rent at the elementary school where we're borrowing their gym, you know, and it smells like spoiled milk that those are not the same problems. And that's, a, you know, that's a single financial issue. That's not a, that's not a people and discipleship and, and, you know, transformation of life kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Two questions to wrap up. First off, uh, the first book you wrote was on uh, basically trying to help uh, everybody navigate the world of the, the preacher's kid. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if, uh, and I think you did a, a real service to all of us by going, hey, don't put everything in a box, but I'm asking you to put it in a box. If you had <laughs> one thing to say to a pastor or church leader um, who's got, you know, uh, maybe a kid in getting into middle school, uh, mm-hmm. you talk to me. I've got a seventh grader. Okay. What's, the, what's one thing you would go, hey, out of all this stuff that you could forget, don't forget this. Man, you are putting me on the spot. I ah, know because I, my risk right now is that I'm going to give you 27 things. Um, <laughs> I think the the blanket message that I would want to give to a pastor, especially if if you still have several years at home with your kids, yeah. is that you are a parent, a father, or a mother. I don't know who listens to this podcast before you are in ministry. Your first ministry is to your family. And I honestly, I don't even think of parenting as a ministry. I think that's sort of a false premise. It's parenting. And so your kids come first. They come first before your sermon. They come first before the church. They come first before the deacons and the elders and everyone else. And if you can't get that straight, you probably shouldn't be in ministry. Mm. And yes, there will be tensions, but you can work those out with your family. Every, yeah. every, everybody who's employed has to do that. Right. Or we have to say, you know, I have to go on this business trip yep. because work is calling me to do this, right. but I will make up for it and we will spend time together in this way. You will be a priority in my life. I will talk to you every day while I'm gone, whatever it is. But parenting comes before ministry, period, in your life. 
And you screw that up, you screw a lot of people's lives up. You screw your church up, you screw your kids up, you probably screw your marriage up too. So that, that would be my, my pointed word mm-hmm. to anybody who's a pastor with kids at home. That's great. No, that's really helpful. Uh, my last question is about the Vikings. Uh, I'm, wanting to, I'm, I'm wanting to check <laughs> oh, on good. you. Oh, so, good. Ending on a happy note. No, it's a two-part question. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll end with the, uh, the sadder part, which is how soon in the uh, championship game did you know, yeah, we're not going to happen this year? Uh, when Case Keenum threw the interception mm-hmm. in the first quarter that got returned for a touchdown. So, yeah. was, so the Vikings went up 7 to nothing on a really crisp drive. And then within two possessions, he had thrown a pick six. I immediately felt like they were down 21 to seven <laughs> and it was, it was seven to seven. And I was like, the momentum has swung so far. The other way. That was a, that was a 21 point touchdown. The Eagles just scored. And uh, so my, my historic Vikings fandom cynicism and, and utter abject fear yeah. uh, was proven correct. Well, and as a, a pastor here in Athens, Georgia, I apologize for Blair Walsh. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel like I need to take some responsibility for that. But on you know, a happier note, Blair Walsh might have been a great kicker if he hadn't been wearing purple. They have a history of some, some <laughs> hey man, horrendous playoff losses. As, as an Alabama fan, I know all about terrible kickers. Uh, I mean, I just like that was the deal that I'm yeah, pretty sure you, Nick Saban made Nick, with the devil. You've got Saban's voodoo going on there. I don't know what he does, but man, it's, <sighs> that, that's just ridiculous. Yes, but I still that's have jealousy PTSD. speaking just yes. purely jealousy yeah but i have ptsd about our kicking game so that's yeah. how that goes but on a happier note um so when uh Diggs catches that ball in the divisional round uh-huh. um what did you injure uh from cheering uh that hard because that my was just vo- phenomenal my voice still hasn't totally recovered yeah um i can no longer hit the high notes when i sing along <laughs> with bohemian rhapsody in the car <laughs> because I, th- I think i i think i blew out a vocal cord or two Oh man, I, I did the exact same thing in, in the championship game. And I can remember cheering uh, with my wife and my middle son who, who was still up and loves football. And, uh, and then for about the next three days, I was like, God oh, damn, I mean, it, I, I jacked something up here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, uh, just kind of wrapping up here. Uh, you've, you've got your own podcast, the Happy Rant Podcast. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we got people who are going to T4G uh, and y'all kind of have the kickoff show. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Plug that. That's uh, the y'all It's the, are, it's the unofficial. We can't claim any affiliation with T4G. And honestly, <laughs> they would probably disown us. But so we have, a, we have a Happy Rant podcast live event on the evening of April 10th. So it's, it's the night right before, uh, right before the conference um, in Louisville. At, uh, it's at one of the Sojourn Church campuses there. Yeah. So if you go to happyrantpodcast.com, you can find out more. So it'll be me and Ted Cluck and Ronnie Martin, the three of us who host the podcast together. Um, we're recording a handful of episodes, hanging out with audience members, doing Q&A. We enjoy being put on the spot by people who come up and ask the randomest Random questions, questions, which is super fun. Yeah. You know, we had questions about like, will there be spicy food in heaven because it hurts my mouth to <laughs> questions about, I don't even know what all sports and some guy who did a spoken word into the microphone. Like it's just, but that fits what we do. We yeah. are, we, we do, we just try to have fun yeah. and do it from, it's, it's a, it, it's Christian, it's, it's church and generally reformed oriented, right. but also really trying to just sort of make light of the silly things yeah. that the church does and, and give people permission to have a good time. And people seem to like it. So yeah. we've got, it's a, we just finished the early bird uh, discount on tickets, but they're only 15 bucks. They're not that expensive. Yeah. And um, so we'd love to have any of your listeners who discover this come out. So happy yeah. You can find out all that stuff. That'd be great. And we'll, uh, we'll link up the podcast books where people can connect with you on social media and make sure they know uh, about this and are able to get there in Louisville. Well, I really appreciate your time. You know, one of the things I like to do on this is just, uh, you know, thank uh, people for particular things. And, and, and I think, you know, getting into your books and, and looking back some of the notes that I took, and I, I just think that you are, you're a gift to the church because uh, you're leaning in, but you're willing to, you're, you're willing to take some punches at us. And just, and and like I said earlier, I think there's a different way to do this. And I think that we, as the people of God in this world, uh, could be better off if we, uh, even imagine some different paths. So, you know, imagining churches that give permission for curiosity and doubt and leaders who lean into that instead of just Mm -hmm. being so certain. So, uh, uh, your voice is helpful to us. I'm grateful for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, thanks again for being on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks again to Barnabas Piper for taking time to be on today's podcast. It was just a great conversation. Enjoyed spending time with him. If you'll go to the show notes again, like I just said, that we have links to... 
basically where you can follow Barnabas on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, he's a fun follow. Uh, you can, uh, We'll link up to his books. Again, we'll link up to both the Happy Rant podcast and to the uh, Together for the Rant live event that they're going to be doing in Louisville right before the Together for the Gospel event. You know, every time we have these conversations, we want to walk away sharing a leadership secret, something that is true that we know, but that we can sometimes forget. And so this is the, the secret that I want to pass along, is that healthy leaders are curious and healthy leaders leave room for doubt. And uh, we talked about this in the, in the conversation with Barnabas, that I think it's a healthy approach to reading the Bible, to your own life, to your own, um, your own ministry, to be able to look for those places where you, you pay attention, uh, you get curious about what God's up to in different situations. I think that opens up brand new avenues for learning. I also think that when it comes to doubt, as he said, there's a, a, a healthy life-giving type of doubt, and there's another type of doubt that's corrosive. You know, the, the kind of doubt that says, I don't know, but I I still trust God. I believe, but help my unbelief. Um, we, we love that uh, verse in the scriptures, and we love that idea, but we don't leave a lot of room for that in our lives, and our leadership. Sometimes people don't see that. We don't allow ourselves to do that because we feel like we always have to have the answers, and we have to be in control because if people were to see us, not know what to do, then maybe they wouldn't want to be part of our church and want to be part of our ministry. So I don't think Barnabas is alone when he says, look, I'd rather be part of a church uh, with somebody who's a real human being, and that's going to be somebody who uh, is curious and has doubts. And so just want to encourage you to leave room uh, for that. And if that's a real struggle for you, then again, just remind you that this is a place uh, for you to ask God to uh, to begin to help you imagine uh, the possibilities of a different way of life. And so that's what we're trying to do here in the Five Factors podcast. We're trying to help you continue to lead well by learning how to live well. And so I think when we talk about different things like our own mental health and leaving room for curiosity and learning uh, doubt and how that affects our vocational health, thinking about our relationships with our kids and how important and vital those are, just another conversation we're having this week to help you really dial in on these five critical areas of your life and leadership that you need to have in place if you want to lead at the highest level for a long time. So again, if you're new to the podcast, you're not familiar with what we're talking about when we talk about the five factors, go to fivefactors.net slash overview and download a free resource that we created that's going to help you see exactly what we're talking about, these five critical areas of your own personal life that have to be uh, paid attention to if you want to lead well and if you want to thrive, if you want to avoid burnout. I think it's absolutely vital that you do this. And next week, we'll come back with another conversation talking about some aspect of the five factors framework so that we can help you continue to be the leader that you want to be. So uh, if you aren't subscribed to the podcast, I would encourage you to go ahead and do that. Go to iTunes, go to Stitcher, go to Google, wherever that is that you do that, go ahead and subscribe. And every Monday morning, another conversation will show up in your podcast inbox. And we'll just continue this journey together following Jesus as a leader. So again, for my co-host, Tal Prince, uh, for myself, Matt Adair, look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Five Factors Podcast.